Some of you had a very peaceful weekend, a good weekend, did a lot of good things. And I know for a number that are here, it was a very dark weekend, a very difficult weekend. It was a dark moment that um, a number of you had to walk through and you're still walking through. As uh, most of you, I'm sure, know, uh, we lost uh, someone uh, as a part of our community. Freshman Isaac Phillips uh, died over the weekend. As a matter of fact, at this very minute, uh, the burial is taking place down the street at Woodlawn Cemetery. Uh, supposed to begin right now. And so we want to just uh, uh, take a few minutes and just remember Isaac, to remember uh, his family and friends and those that are just grieving beyond what I can imagine. As they say their goodbyes today, today there will be a memorial in Alumni Auditorium at 2 o'clock, and all of you are welcome to be a part of that, to support the family and, and just remember Isaac. And so right now, I ask that, uh, that all of you stand up together. And we're just going to take a, a moment just to remember to pause in silence. Remember Isaac, remember his family and those that love him. And just remember this young man. And then we'll pray and we ask you to remain standing as we go into worship. Father, it's an honor to know you and to be loved by you. And Lord, we need your presence right now, your love right now. Lord, we thank you for the words that you speak to us. You just say, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and you will give us rest. Lord, you know that um, there are a number that are here and a number right now at the cemetery, just right down the street, that are really burdened beyond belief, that they're weary from the pain. And we just lift them up to you. I lift up every student here. No matter what they're struggling with now, if there's joy or if there's a real sense of uh, weariness and heaviness. And we know you're right here in the middle of this. And you're with us and you're with the Phillips family. You're with the friends. Lord, you're with the family. You're with those who love him. And so, Lord, we remember him. And we pray that you'll walk with us through the challenges of life that we look to you and we will trust you even when we don't know what the answer is we don't know what to say what to ask Lord we trust you we trust you we praise you and we worship you we honor you in Jesus amen I want to begin with a a prayer You, God, who are the maker of heaven and earth and have promised to remake them, hear my prayer this morning. I plead to you, God, because sometimes you do seem so far away and so distant. 
And so I ask you, Lord, to pay attention and to hear our plea this morning. For why do you seem so distant? Why in times of trouble do you seem like you hide yourself? Father, I hate death. And I trust that you hate it too. But it seems like it invades our world so often and it surrounds us in so many ways. God, we want to give that to you. For Lord, we, we hurt inside. We struggle with the pain of loss. We struggle with the pain of death. And we wonder why, God, that why is death even meaningful in this world? Would it not be better? Would it, would it not be to your glory just to rescue us from death so that we might praise you in the land of the living? How can we praise you in the grave? Where is the testimony of your steadfast love when we stand at the grave? So, Father, we, we ask how long how long must we have this sorrow in our heart every day? How long before you do something, God? How long before you rise up and destroy this enemy that oppresses us? And Lord, you know, you know I've given my life to you, and I entrust you with my life. You are my God. I entrust you with my death. I believe, Father, that you are the maker of heaven and earth. I believe, Jesus, that you were born of woman, that you walked among us, that you died with us, that you rose for us, and that you are at the right hand of the Father interceding in our lives even now. And I believe, Spirit, that you are present among us to transform and comfort us. And I confess, Father, that this story is not over. That you will remake this world one day. And that you will rid us of this enemy and wipe away our tears. So rise up, O oh God, and create your new world. Comfort us, O oh Spirit, and come again soon, Lord Jesus. Amen. Many of you have probably personally encountered death already in your lives. Some of you... Maybe that's a distant idea. I encountered it re re relatively early in my life, maybe not as early as some of you. Some of you have lost parents early in age and lost siblings early in age. But I was about your age when I married, and after about two years, 11 months, and 10 days, my wife died. I was in a moment that I didn't know what to do with that. I had no preparation for it. I had no sense of it. It was a total shock. I didn't know what to do with it. All I knew was I felt really angry. And I knew exactly who I was angry with. I was angry with God. See, God and I had this deal, I thought, you know. You know, God and I, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, God. You know, we'll work this out, right? So, God, if I devote my life to you, you're going to make it good. And it all comes crashing down on one evening and two in the morning. 
And for months, I did not talk to God. I was afraid to talk to God. I never doubted that God was there. But I didn't like the God that I envisioned. The God who had allowed this or did this or whatever happened. God didn't keep his part of the bargain. And so I was silent. And I stewed on it. Until a friend of mine said, John Mark, you ought, to, you ought to read the Psalms. And I thought, you know, I, I've read the Psalms before. You know, I'm a Bible major from Freed Hartman College. You can't get much better than that. Unless you're a Bible major from Lipscomb, then now you can, okay, no. But something worked on my heart with that, and I started reading the Psalms. And I come up to, to chapter 6, and it says, How long, O Lord? I come up to chapter 10. Psalm 10 says, Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? And I'm saying, I'm starting to like this. This is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm thinking. I get to Psalm 13 and it says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long must I have sorrow in my heart every day? When are you going to do something, God? Now that made sense to me. And I started reading... And I started praying again, but this time I started praying the Psalms. Because that language gave me a voice. I don't know what you do with death. And I'm not here to tell you what to do with it. I'm just sharing what happened with me. And what happened with me is that when death invaded my life, I was powerless. I didn't have a voice. I didn't have words. I didn't know what to do with this. Struggled with my faith. Struggled with my discipleship. Until I realized through reading the Psalms that I could be honest with God. I could be real with God. I could tell God exactly what I was feeling. I could tell God exactly what I was angry about. I could tell God to get off the couch and get your hands out of your pocket and do something. That's Psalm 74. And it liberated my faith. It gave me a voice. It, it liberated my faith to say, you know, I can talk like that with God. I can be honest with God. And you know what that revealed about God? It revealed that God has a love so deep, so broad, that He can absorb my anger. And He can absorb my questions. I can ask why and how long. But you know, there's a part of me though that, that while I lived in that mode and, and used the Psalms in that way, it, there was a part of me that was revealed later on that I wasn't aware of. And it's when my son came along, Joshua. Named him Joshua so that he might be a leader among God's people, right? Joshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus. We thought Jesus would be a little much. But Joshua we could go with, right? And as he was growing up, we knew something was wrong with him. Uh, he was developmentally delayed in a lot of ways. You know, he never spoke more than a sentence at a, you know, in a spill and... Never could color in the lines. Never could do his ABCs. It just something was wrong. 
He was hyperactive and he'd destroy everything he came in contact with. Got kicked out of fifth, five-year-old Baptist kindergarten. Now, you've got to be pretty bad to do that. We had no idea what was wrong. Until I was speaking at a church one day and a nurse, pediatric neurologist nurse, for whom I am so grateful walked up to me standing next to Joshua and said, you need to take him to a pediatric neurologist. Boom, I was there as soon as I could. That day, we were told he wasn't going to get better. Joshua died May 21st, 2001. 16 years old. Couldn't even say, I love you, Dad, the last three years of his life. Well, I was angry again. This time I knew what to do with that. I, I took that anger to God, but here's what I didn't know. What I didn't realize and what I came to learn was that I needed a community around me. I needed people around me with whom I could speak my honest words, with whom I could feel safe. I needed some people around me that I could verbalize this to and I could talk it out with. I needed a community to lament with me. I couldn't do this alone. God did not create us to be alone. God did not create us to weep alone. God did not create us to rejoice alone. We are intended to be netted together in community and to share joys as well as to share burdens. And I had to learn a very hard lesson in my life that I needed the intimacy of other people. And my ego and my pride said, I, I don't want to do that, you know. I don't want to say I need help. I don't want to say I need some, somebody else to come into my life and, and, and guide me. I, I need some advice. I didn't want to say any of that. I didn't want that and I crashed. And I learned that I do need other people. And I need people who will hear me say, I got a problem with God. And that they will love me just like God loves me. I hope you have people like that in your life. It's a hard lesson to learn. But this is the role of lament in life. It is to lament to God about death and about hurts and pains and struggles and it's to lament as a community and to share that together. But lament doesn't have to stay in lament. It seems to me that the value of lament is to get it out. The value of the lament is to kind of learn to let it go. To, to let it out of us, to vent it, to put it out here and let us see it for what it is and let that get out of our soul and the bitterness of our soul. Let it get out and let God work some spiritual therapy on us and let the community of believers work some life in us. That we learn to, to walk out of the fog, to get our way through the fog and to see the beauty of the world and the goodness of the world, even though it is stained with death, and even though the graveyard looks so permanent, there is still the goodness and the love of God that we experience through God's people and through our friends and through the story God has given us. This is what Paul does in Romans 8 after he talks about this suffering 
he, he recognizes that we groan for a new world, that the whole creation groans and is enslaved and is oppressed and burdened, and we want to break out of this. We want life. We don't want death. We hate death. Death is an enemy. And we want God to wake up and destroy it. And we yearn for that. Andrew Peterson has a song called Come Back Soon. And in that song, he has a line that just, the first time I heard it, I almost fell out of my chair. I mean, it just knocked me over because it was so on target. And, he, and the line is, every death is a question mark. Every death is a question mark. But God has answered the question. Oh, He hasn't answered the question in the sense of what is the meaning of this? Or what is this about? Or how can I live life in the light of this death? Or how can I work through this? And how can I grieve through this? I mean, those are all things we struggle with. But the answer that God has given us is the answer that Paul gave in Romans chapter 8. When after talking about that struggle of life and death, without talking about the suffering that we all engage, and he even quotes a lament psalm from Psalm 44. And he says, you know, we're out here like sheep to be slaughtered. That's what it feels like. We're just getting slaughtered, God. We're like sheep getting slaughtered. So where's the shepherd? And God and Paul says, no. You know, I know I can feel that way. I know I can look that way. But let me point you to another vision. Let me point you to another sight. Let me point you to something that looks beyond the present experience of hurt and pain. Let me point you to Jesus Christ. And Paul says, no, that's, we are more than conquerors through Him who has loved us. And that there is nothing, there is neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. See, I can stand by the coffin of my wife and doubt the love of God. And I have. I can, I can go to the grave of my son and I can have some pretty angry words and doubt the goodness of God. And I have. But the story I keep coming back to the one that renews me, the one that calls me into life, calls me into the new world that God envisions, the new world without death, the new world without pain, the new world with justice and peace where the people of God learn war no more. The vision that calls me to that is to be able to kneel at the cross and hear the testimony of God. I love you. No matter what happens. No matter what you experience. No matter how shaky it gets. Nothing. Can separate you. From my love. That's the word of the Lord.